Back in my day, the forbidden door was the one that was always locked in my Uncle Fred's basement that I was never, ever, under any circumstances to try and open. But nowadays, the forbidden door is simply metaphorical and relates to wrestling companies working together more prominently. AEW, New Japan, Impact and others doing business together is exciting, no doubt, but it's not exactly a groundbreaking concept or anything. Co-promotion and talent sharing has happened plenty of times in the past, whether for a one-off match or show or a full-on storyline. Don't believe me? Then just watch this video and PayPal me 20 English pounds by way of an apology. I'm Adam Pachisi from Cultaholic Wrestling and these are 10 times wrestling's forbidden door was opened. Join us. Number 10, WCW and ECW work together. During the Monday Night Wars, ECW and WCW were the fiercest of enemies. In pre-war times, when ECW were Eastern and not yet extreme, the companies were on somewhat friendlier terms and even did each other a couple of favors in 1994. In exchange for promoting WCW's upcoming Slamboree pay-per-view, which was being held in ECW Stronghold Philadelphia on their TV show, Paul Heyman's promotion were loaned Arn Anderson and Bobby Eaton for an angle and eventual match with Sabu and Terry Funk, with Funk going back the other way to work some WCW shows as a member of the Stud Stable. A request by Heyman to have some of his talent appear on WCW TV was nixed, but the two sides ended up working together once more months later after WCW and Mexican promotion AAA decided to co-promote a pay-per-view called When Worlds Collide, a name already bagsied by ECW. As part of a lawsuit settlement, Austin, along with Sherry Martell and Kevin Sullivan were booked for an ECW show, but the former Dangerous Alliance man got injured before his match and WCW ended up sending his old Hollywood Blondes tag partner Brian Pillman as a replacement. Number 9. Mr. Monday Night Though ECW and WCW may have been, at best, reluctant bedfellows, Paul Heyman's promotion and WWE had a full-on working arrangement which allowed ECW to promote their maiden pay-per-view voyage, 1997's Barely Legal, on Monday Night Raw. At Barely Legal, Rob Van Dam, a late replacement for an injured Chris Candido, cut a promo where he threatened jumping to one of the big two and, a month later, turned up on Raw to squash a young Jeff Hardy. Things ramped up some when noted ECW critic Jerry Lawler turned up at the company's Wrestlepalooza, apparently having recruited RVD and Sabu in his crusade against all things extreme. And so the newly dubbed Mr. Monday Night began showing up more frequently on WWE TV, including teaming with The King on a couple of occasions. Regrettably, the storyline ended prematurely when Van Damme declined to lose a match to road dog Jesse James and was no longer invited back. Lawler, however, would hold up his side of the bargain and eventually put over the ECW flag bearer Tommy Dreamer at Hardcore Heaven. Number 8. The World Wrestling Peace Festival After taking a crew of New Japan and WCW wrestlers to North Korea a year before, Antonio Inoki continued his quest to improve international relations via pro wrestling with his World Wrestling Peace Festival. Put on to promote world peace, duh, the card featured 46 wrestlers from six countries representing various organizations. New Japan was involved, obviously, as were WCW, the NWA, All Japan Women, and putting aside their heated rivalry, both of Mexico's top promotions, AAA and CMLL. There were company-specific matches, but also some interpromotional ones, like a women's tag match that featured participants from AAA, CMLL, and All Japan Women, and a Lex Luger vs. Masa Saito WCW vs. New Japan Showdown. The World Wrestling Peace Festival may not have drawn as well as hoped, attracting around 5,000 people to the 17,000 seater LA Sports Arena, but it was successful in other ways, particularly from a critical in-ring perspective. The show also alerted WCW exec Eric Bischoff to the talents of Chris Jericho, Rey Mysterio, and Ultimo Dragon, all of whom would sign with his company in the following weeks. A planned Terry Funk vs. Sabu vs. Brian Pillman match on the show was scrapped, not for political reasons, but because Pillman got into an awful car wreck weeks before, and Sabu booked himself on a tour of Japan instead. Number 7. Jushin Thunder Liger vs Tyler Breeze 
The influx of independent and international stars that came to prime black and gold era NXT created umpteen dream match scenarios. And while it may have felt like the forbidden door had opened, the fact was that everybody was under contract to WWE. Since Vince McMahon's company don't typically co-promote or use talent from other organizations, the odds of them reaching out and bringing in anyone not signed were pretty slim. However, thanks to NXT general manager William Regal, we got the chance to see legendary Japanese junior heavyweight Jushin Thunder Liger ply his trade in a WWE ring for the only time. And I don't just mean it was Regal's doing in kayfabe sense either. As Regal later explained via his Twitter account, he really did reach out to Liger, who he'd known ever since a young Liger wrestled in Britain as Flying Fuji Yamada in the 1980s. Thanks to their kinship, the inventor of the Shooting Star Press came in to wrestle Tyler Breeze in the opener of 2015's sensational TakeOver Brooklyn. The New Japan mainstay was later recognized for his historic career when he was inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame. Number 6. The Wrestling Summit 1990 What's this? The World Wrestling Federation collaborating with not just one, but two Japanese promotions? And what's this? Those two Japanese promotions are noted rivals All Japan and New Japan? See folks, we can all get along. As long as you don't ever speak to me, anyway. WWE and New Japan had enjoyed a working relationship for a fair while at this point, truth be told, with wrestlers from both sides going back and forth across the Pacific to work for the other company. 1990's Pro Wrestling Summit was a stacked card featuring matches between Japanese talent, matches between WWE talent, and matches between Japanese and WWE talent, such as Bret Hart vs Tiger Mask and Genichiro Tenryu against Randy Savage, all taking place in front of a sold-out Tokyo Dome. The main event was a tricky political proposition, with Vince McMahon adamant that he wanted WWE Champion Hulk Hogan to go up against another American. Tenryu was originally booked against the Hulkster, only to be replaced by Terry Gordy, who then got cold feet about doing the clean job, brother, and was swapped with Stan Hansen. In the wake of the summit, Tenryu would create the Super World of Sports promotion and continue working with McMahon for the next couple of years. Number 5. USWA vs ECW on WWE Raw As we saw previously, WWE were happy to lend a hand to ECW in early 1997 as the Extreme Outfits sought to promote their first foray into pay-per-view. And I mean, let's face it, ECW invading Raw that time instantly made WWE's flagship show seem ten times cooler and more exciting than it had been for a while. Soon enough, however, WWE lost interest in perpetuating any sort of interpromotional rivalry. They did allow ECW to continue appearing on their television show Mind and booked Chris Candido, who had worked for WWE as Body Donna Skip not too long beforehand, against Brian Christopher. This was interesting because Chris Christopher, making his WWE debut, was billed as representing the Memphis-based USWA promotion. That meant WWE were promoting a match between two wrestlers from supposedly rival companies, though Christopher would soon come in full-time. They didn't give them a ton of airtime, allocating the bout just a few minutes, as well as a bit extra for the post-match angle with Heyman, Jerry Lawler, and Tommy Dreamer. Interestingly, the original plan was to do Dreamer vs Candido in an ECW guest match, but Heyman nixed the idea. Number 4. The Super J Cup the brainchild of junior heavyweight standard bearer Jushin Thunder Liger, the Super J Cup was only supposed to be a one-time deal, but ended up doing so well both critically and commercially that it's one of New Japan's most popular events to this day. Designed to elevate the perception of junior heavyweight wrestling in Japan, the J Cup consisted of a four-round single elimination tournament comprised of 14 wrestlers from six different companies. New Japan had six entrants, including Dean Malenko and Eddie Guerrero wrestling as the masked Black Tiger, but other participants were drafted in from FMW, Mishinoku Pro, Wrestle Association R, Mexico CMLL, and the Social Progress Wrestling Federation. A sold-out sumo hall in Tokyo was treated to classic contests, surprising upsets, and breakout performances from what is generally considered one of the greatest single nights of wrestling ever. Though there must have been plenty of politics involved when it came to the booking of the tournament and who beat who, everyone came out of the show looking better than they went into it, with the likes of the great Sasuke going from a relative unknown to a genuine superstar. Number 3. Terry Funk's WrestleFest 
Who doesn't love Terry Funk? The answer is no one. Everyone loves the Funker, so when the legend announced that he was definitely 100% for real retiring in the fall of 1997, wrestlers from various companies agreed to appear on his WrestleFest card. Almost 4,000 people in Amarillo's Tri-State Fairgrounds Coliseum witnessed a show that was largely made up of ECW talent and was promoted for six weeks on ECW TV, but also featured notable names from Japan and WWE. The two big inter-promotional matches of the evening were Mankind taking on Sabu and WWE Champion Bret Hart squaring off with the man from the Double Cross Ranch in a no-DQ main event. Despite being the champ, the hitman insisted that he put Funk over, though he was eventually overruled. The event was later released on VHS and DVD under the ECW banner, with the WWE stars not being advertised on the front cover via either their name or likeness. Despite being billed as Funk's last match in the Amarillo Territory, he did wrestle there two more times in 2000 and 2002 for WCW and XPW respectively. Number 2. Super Clash 3 with AWA circling the drain in 1988, Vern Gagne rolled the dice and struck a deal with Jerry's Jarrett and Lawler to make the king his world champion, sending him out to other dying territories like World Class to defend the title. It must have gone well, because Gagne then decided to run his third Super Clash show with the help of wrestlers from Memphis, World Class, and the short-lived Powerful Women of Wrestling promotion. In short, Super Clash 3, the only AWA show ever broadcast on pay-per-view, was a complete and utter disaster. Disaster. Not only did it draw terribly at both the live gate and on pay-per-view, but the bookers involved couldn't agree on the time of day, let alone what the finishes of the main matches would be on the night. The matches themselves were mostly crap too, besides an AWA and WCWA heavyweight title unification bout between Lawler and Kerry Von Erich. Good as the match was, the promise of a definitive winner was not fulfilled, as Kerry ended up losing in controversial circumstances, and Garnier demanded his AWA title belt back from Lawler about a week later. Number 1. Vince McMahon in Memphis Vince McMahon morphed into the villainous Mr. McMahon character in the wake of the Montreal Screwjob, quickly becoming the top heel in the wrestling business. The genetic jackhammer was a riot in the role, but then he'd had practice, hadn't he? And no, I'm not insinuating his real-life tyranny was practice for his on-screen alter ego, even if I sort of am. I'm talking about Mr. McMahon's time working for Memphis in 1993. Though not acknowledged on WWE television, Vince had gone to Jerry Lawler's USWA promotion to feud with the king. While simply an on-screen announcer for his own company, McMahon was able to let loose as a villain in Lawler's territory, cutting wild-eyed promos and even getting physically involved in a match for the first time. As part of this mini-invasion, WWE stars like Randy Savage, Tatonka and Bretton Owen Hart took trips to the home of the Blues, all of them working as heels despite being babyface in their home promotion. It was novel to witness the WWE good guys go bad for the local crowd, and it was certainly interesting to catch a glimpse at what would be the prototype for the Mr. McMahon character that emerged years later. 